Okay, so we're going to go over designing and planning courses. We'd already talked about um, how to be an effective teacher in the last lecture. So we're going to cover some of the things to be thinking about as you're doing some course planning. So I've provided to you, there's a link here to the APA guidelines for the undergraduate psychology major coming from the APA. Now this is version 2.0. It was released in um, August 2013, um, just to kind of give you an idea of how old it is. Um, there have there you know, there are definitely considerations for making changes to this. I'll cover this in just a minute. Um, but these are really really great guidelines to uh, try to have some standardization when it comes to looking at the undergraduate psychology major. Um, we'll get into more detail there, but you can actually get the full PDF from that link that I have here. I also have the link in the notes in the PowerPoint slides. And then another really, really wonderful resource is the Center for Teaching Excellent, uh, the CTE that USC has. Um, and so I've got a, a link here, but there are multiple links. And this is kind of like just the, the sort of main page for course design. There's a bunch of ways that you can go from here um, in terms of uh, direction. So, um, you know, this can kind of like lead you down almost a rabbit hole if you are interested in a particular modality. So online teaching, distributed learning, whatever it might be. Um, one other thing that um, I kind of want to bring out here um, with the Centers of Teaching Excellence is that they have instructional designers. And so the instructional designer's job is to help you uh, design the course, whether it's aesthetically trying to understand how to set things up, um, trying to make it you know better for accessibility, whatever it might be. And so we actually do have instructional designers who are uh, you know part of our USC system, and they're really, really helpful um, to meet with. You can do a consultation with them. They can help you uh, design the course, especially if you're not very well versed in the learning management system. And our learning management system is Blackboard. We also have uh, UltraView Blackboard. Um, so if you want to uh, meet with somebody, that's actually really, really great uh, resource. You can meet with them multiple times um, to help design your course. So I will be kind of referring to uh, this APA resource and the CTE source kind of throughout um, this uh, uh, lecture. And the idea is, is that um, you know, there's a set of expectations uh, for teaching psychology to undergraduates, and there's nice tables all throughout it that explain, you know, these are the things that we would expect a psychology major who graduates to, uh, these are the skills that we would expect, and this is the information that they, you know, that we would expect that they come out of this, uh, out of a major. Um, there is a draft 3.0, and you can actually find this online, and it's labeled as a draft. Um, and I think the intention is to uh, hopefully at least every 10 years renew the APA guidelines. There have been a lot of changes over the last 10 years um, that I think will apply to some of these expectations that we have as psych majors. So um, I don't know if they're, uh, you know, what the release, anticipated release date is, but I would be looking for that probably around August 2023. Um, and so, you know, some things to consider. So, uh, you know, only 20 to 24% of our majors are going to complete graduate study in psychology. How do you teach to people who are not, you know, thinking of going into graduate school and continuing their education in psychology? Um, <clears throat> so what that means is that, you know, maybe we need to have a you know, better connection between employer needs and like a liberal arts education, since that tends to be very vague, um, you know, are we setting these students up for a good uh, scenario if we say, okay, you know, here's what we expect you to learn in the major, and then if they never apply that later on, you know, that, that disconnect needs to be, needs to be uh, uh, corrected. Um, and then we tend to serve as covert career counselors, right? Um, we are guiding this coursework, their learning experiences, learning outcomes, and you know they may our students may have a wide variety of directions in terms of where they want to go for their career. Many times, uh, it has something to do with psychology, but it may not be as obvious. And so, um, you know, thinking about our target audience as we're designing our course, are we teaching to just majors? Are we teaching a higher level class? Are we teaching to freshmen or first year students who might not um, necessarily see themselves going into a traditional psych psychology career? So things just to kind of think about. We'll talk about audience and things about uh, uh, related to that later. So um, five major guidelines that the APA kind of goes over in their uh, guidelines 2.0. Um, and so, you know, again, there's some really great tables on that PDF. I really want you to check that out um, because it goes through each one of these in terms of expectations. So like knowledge base and psychology. 
um, you know, what kinds of things do we expect students to be able to know? Like, can they describe key concepts and principles, overarching themes? Um, do they understand uh, or have a working knowledge of uh, content domains in psychology? Can they describe applications of psychology? And then what skills do their future employers want them to know and be able to do um, coming from having a, a, you know, having a resume that says psychology major and psychology degree? What do those employers want to see um, our, you know, um, our graduates possess? What kind of skills should they possess? Um, the second goal, the scientific inquiry and critical thinking, you know, we want students uh, in, in terms of, of us, ourselves, our department, but also the APA in general, they want students who um, are demonstrating that they understand uh, psychology information literacy. You know, we want our students to be literate in terms of being able to read um, uh, papers and articles and understand basic concepts to be able to use scientific reasoning to interpret psychological phenomenon and you know say oh it's just magic no what is the science behind that is it a pseudoscience um understand uh and be able to think um critically uh be able to problem solve even very basic psychological research our students should be able to interpret that um, should be able to design experiments and understand the value of experimental design um even at the very basic level um, understand cause and effect claims. Right? The third one, this one's difficult, you know, ethical and social responsibility in a diverse world, um, being able to apply ethical standards, being able to evaluate psychological science and practice, um, understanding how to build inter interpersonal relationships and understand behavior, um, understand values that build community at all levels, local, national, global. Um, how can psychology uh, promote civil, social, and global out outcomes that benefit others. You know, we talk about um, the bystander effect and how that impacts uh, how people decide to help or not, you know, and, and understanding that even really basic behavioral um, explanations can impact those around us. Um, <clears throat> how does psychology benefit the globe? Or, you know, how does it benefit the community at each sort of level of analysis? Um, communication, and this one tends to be frustrating for some because uh, a lot of uh, faculty may not want to have uh, ways for students to practice communication, but this is vital to students coming out of a psychology major having these skills. So effective writing, effective presenting, being able to communicate with their professor, with their peers, with other people. Um, Understanding that there's cultural bias, that, that, you know, values and other biases can breed misunderstanding in communication. Um, understanding effective interactions with people with lots of diverse backgrounds, right? So being able to understand um, stereotypes and how that works in the world and how it dictates um, how we behave uh, uh, across each other um, and within different groups. Um, the final one, this is professional development, and this one can be uh, a little tricky because, again, we don't know, we can't prepare for every single student that we come out in terms of, like, we know exactly where everybody's going and, and where their career is going to lead them, but being able to apply the content that they're learning to career goals, being able to... Um, hone their skills and if you give them a project for example helping them build the project management skills um, for example I have a, a project in one of my classes that has a planning sheet where they actually have to write in on a schedule uh, up to the due date how often they're going to work on this and what they're going to work on to build those skills um, enhancing teamwork a lot of people don't like <laughs> group projects but sometimes if you do and we talked about the jigsaw approach before if you do a project where everybody's contributing um, a piece but then their full grade isn't you know dependent necessarily on everybody's work can still facilitate those um, teamwork skills um, and so you know these are the kinds of things that we want to think about how are we going to help our students uh, gain these skills and sometimes it's very obvious in your class and sometimes it it isn't as obvious um, there is a paper that I have you guys um, as part of your reading list is it's the Nevitt and McClellan 2013 paper um, using action verbs as learning outcomes so this is applying Bloom's taxonomy 
to uh, particular objectives in an introductory to psychology course. And so this is really helpful to see these kind of action words, you know, um, remember, understand, apply, you know, how are we getting students to uh, what kind of assessment, like what are we, what is the goal, and then how are we going to assess that they've learned that goal, and we need um, some action words and, and verbs to demonstrate um, how they are learning and what they are learning and what they're what they're keeping. And so, you know, at the very top of this pyramid is that, you know, producing original work, and so these are some really, really wonderful um, action words that you can put on your um, learning objective and outcomes to say, okay, I want you to, you know, construct this, develop this, formulate this. Um, and, you know, at the bottom of this pyramid, remember, this is just very basic sort of memorization, rote memorization, um, be able to understand the meaning of this word, to define this word. And of course, as you move up the um, the pyramid, we have uh, an increased understanding and ability to take the information and actually do something with it all the way up to creating. Um, so this is a really, really great model to use when you're developing your learning objectives. You know, start with your goal and say, where do I want to go from there? And we're going to talk a little bit more about that here in just a few minutes. But just kind of keeping this in mind and using these action words, really helpful um, to put on your, on your learning objectives. You know, there's going to be some of each of this. There's going to be some just learning the words and then, you know, learning what these terms mean. Um, but you really want to start getting up higher into this taxonomy where you get students to actually be able to take something from your course and uh, uh, demonstrate that they've they've actually been able to apply those concepts. Um, one kind of, we're going to take a quick sidetrack to accessibility. This is something that you really um, need to consider in your course is becoming more and more uh, talked about. There's a couple of uh, nice uh, CTE resources here that I've got. Um, when you have your course accessible to more people, um, it tends to not just help those people, right? So if you say, okay, well, um, one, one really great example that we try to do is this one right here. So if you're teaching an online class and you are um, you know, providing a video, it's really good to have a transcript along with that video. And so if you post um, the uh, the video and a student who is not hard of hearing, not, no issues with, no, no reason necessarily to need accommodation for a transcript, but they can see the transcript on the bottom, but they're not, they're not able to, or they're not in a particular place where they can actually listen to the, um, listen to the lecture. So they might need to read those subtitles because uh, they don't have, maybe they don't have headphones and they're, you know, uh, writing on uh, the bus to school or they're in a dorm room that's really loud and they um, can't listen and they can't hear it, but they can read it. So it helps students that may not need that accommodation, but it's something that's really helpful um, to it, it make make your information more accessible. So, you know, anytime you're thinking about designing a course, you do want to try your best to make it accessible to lots of different diverse people. So um, one thing to consider, and there's some really great examples of, of uh, on these CTE sites of how to make sure that this, this actually works. So when you post things to Blackboard, um, some people might be using screen reading software. They might have a disability where they have to, they can't um, read the font or they have um, a, a, um, a, a vision issue or they have some kind of sensory issue where they can't read the material so they need it read to them. And so um, there's ways to, to use Microsoft Word and PowerPoint and tables and all these sorts of things where you can make it so that it will read out a description um, and the resources here are really, really fantastic. This is a checklist, but this right here, if you start here and work your way through the site, it gives you lots of really great examples and shows you step-by-step -step with screenshots how to do these sorts of things to make your information more accessible. Very simple, just very simply speaking, make sure your internet links work. It doesn't matter if what modality you're teaching. If you've got information up on your learning management system on Blackboard, make sure it actually uh, works. Make sure that you don't have dead links or old links. Um, font is really important, especially for people who um, have sensory issues. Um, so uh, the sans serif fonts are great for visual impairment. So antique olive, Tahoma, everything here is in Tahoma. Um, just to kind of give you an example, this whole PowerPoint is in Tahoma. Um, Verdana, uh, Verdana, 
um, Helvetica, and there's one particular one that's been produced specifically for people with visual impairments. It's called A font. And that's really helpful to um, people who have visual impairments. Also, if you need to do large print, that is would be 18 point font or larger. Um, and that is something that is, is helpful for students to be able to read through. So kind of keeping that in mind in terms of, of what kind of font you want to use. Um, when it comes to uh, thinking about your audience, right? So um, how much background do the students have coming in? Are you taking ta teaching an introductory level class? Who are you teaching um, a, a survey class? Are you teaching an upper level class where students should have a prerequisite? Um, how many uh, people are going to be majors? Um, you know, what what kinds of things are they interested in terms of that's going to be a future career goal for them? Um, so that's, you know, uh, that's an important consideration is, is who are you teaching to? Um, and you can do polls and you can ask students, but you should have an idea if you're taking, if you're teaching an introductory course versus an upper level course, you should have a pretty good indication of what's going on there. Um, for design in general, so uh, selecting some learning outcomes, we're going to come back to this and talk about this in more detail. Um, being able to tie those learning outcomes to the skills that they're going to need and that they're going to develop over the course of the the um, the course and so what skills uh, are going to be built and then what content do you need to provide them to support those skills um, in terms of backward design we talked we're, we're, we're going to talk more in detail about this so there's a, a reading that I have for you guys um, it's from Darby and Lang small teaching online it's a really really great text it's a really good book um, the the summary is what I've given you guys. But basically what you do with backward design is you start with the most essential goals that you want for your students and then you later focus on content, right? So content is, is not important right now. Um, right now you focus on the essential goals and then how you want them to, how you want your students to reach those goals. Um, second, you think, how am I gonna assess these goals? And these, that is where your activities and your assignments and your tests come from. So step one, what are the essential goals? What are the, what are the major things I want students to learn when they leave this class? Um, then how am I gonna assess that? And then you can focus on content later. After you figured out the schedule, you basically work yourself backwards. You work from the end date, end you know lecture material date, all the way to the beginning, and then fit <clears throat> fit the content in based off of how you can um, actually work that. The book itself was written for online teaching, but there's some really really great concepts there that I think you guys would would find very valuable. Um, the textbook selection is also, so it, it, adopting a text is, is important because um, that's going to help students uh, get supplementary information. Maybe you use the text um, materials that come with it. Uh, you know, you want to look through the text and make sure it's appropriate in terms of the language and the tone for your students. Make sure it's not like overly... Um, you know, if it might be too much and, and, and too detailed, if, you te te if you're teaching an introductory level class and it's just one of those really, really advanced texts, you know, you may want to reconsider. You always think about your audience. Um, now, you can uh, always request a textbook from a publisher for free. So you can, um, you, we, we all have, you know, like, for example, McGraw-Hill, um, you know, we have uh, different representatives who will give us access to materials if we're looking at adopting a text potentially. Um, you can get on email listservs that will uh, send you, oh, hey, we've got this new edition out or we've got these, this new text out. And um, that helps you determine if you want to adopt it. So basically they send you either an electronic access or uh, a, a, just a physical book. And then you can look through it and see, you know, is this something that I like? I like these graphics or I like this package. Um, and then you can think about also supplements. So um, many of these publisher companies have supplements like um, supplements for homework, right? So they might have sample homework problems or a set of homework problems. They'll have test bank questions, which can be dangerous because chances are if there's a test bank out there, then students have it somewhere. Um, so you could take the test bank questions and reword them so that they're harder to uh, Google and, and identify. Um, but, you know, having a bank of 300 questions per chapter is really helpful to start with. 
Um, many publishers have PowerPoints for each chapter with notes and, and content on that, which is really helpful because it saves you a step of creating PowerPoints if that's how you want to teach. Um, also has access to uh, videos, other multimedia resources, or even like full modules and whole systems. Um, one thing that you do have to consider that I that I do want to kind of bring in uh, is cost. So if you are dealing with students that you think might uh, struggle with uh, the cost of the textbook or with the supplementary uh, access, um, then you really need to con reconsider the the materials. Um, I, for example, Launchpad is one of um, the uh, platforms that uh, instructors use and that has example uh, that has tests on it and examples and videos and it's a system that they actually students have to go through and complete so you can't take the course without it in some cases and that can get expensive and sometimes students will say well I can't afford this launch pad subscription you know what uh, what alternatives do you have for me and so it may be that you don't have one and it may be that you know another instructor is teaching a, another section and you suggest well you know i know that you're you're having a particular hardship perhaps you consider reconsider into a different section um and you know and then there are of course some sometimes in certain schools they have uh, pots of money for people who um, are struggling getting their books or getting subscription to services, things like that. So there's sometimes there there are ways uh, depending on uh, the situation you have to kind of look at those for, look for those um, resources. Finally, probably the best way to do it is to meet with your your reps, your publisher reps, and just see um, what options you have and what sort of new things are, are coming out, and that'll help you kind of guide what you want to select for the class. Um, Thinking about how you present the material, so if you do this in sort of like a backward design, right, so you are uh, sort of starting, instead of chronologically, you're starting backwards um, and, uh, uh, you know, going through and saying, okay, what what do we want to start with? And so the chronological order would be, of course, start with the basics and then work your way up uh, so, you know, you uh, uh, have a, a way to build um, that information. Um, you can do sort of a thematic presentation where you have themes and topics. You could take a textbook and just go straight in chapter order. Um, some people like to do this because it's nice and structured, but others say, oh, well, I, you know, there was one instructor that I knew that didn't like to, to uh, present um, the neuroscience part of introduction to psychology early, because usually in a lot of textbooks, it's like chapter two. Uh, that person actually waited until later in the semester to teach it because it tended to be very intimidating to students and um, they would drop the class. And, you know, they, the students would do, would do fine in it. It's just that they it kind of scared them off. So sometimes um, the book chapter order isn't doesn't make sense for how you want to teach. You might have uh, either your personal interest or the class's personal interest. And you might want to pull them and see what they want uh, to learn about and how much time you want to spend on that topic. Um, some things you have to consider. Uh, do you need to build on something that has like a prerequisite that they already know? Do they? Do you need to establish that knowledge? In my intro to neuroscience class, I assume students know nothing about cell biology, and so I start with this is the nucleus of the cell. And you know, a lot of students appreciate that because they might not have seen that ever before, or it's might it might has been a long time. Um, and then, you know, think about well, what do I want to eliminate? Do I want to eliminate certain topics? Do I want to add certain topics based off of time? Um, usually you do have to do some kind of, uh, um, you know, figure out how much time do you have to do that thing. Um, now, when it comes to uh, how you assess um, and grade uh, you know, that comes with the goals that you have in the class. Uh, we always suggest to diversify the activities because if you give students a lot of opportunities to earn their grade, they appreciate it a lot more because if you just have a class and they have three exams and that's how they get their grade, it doesn't give them a lot of opportunities to demonstrate their knowledge along the way. Um, and it can be really devastating if they make a bad grade on one thing and feel like it's going to basically ruin their whole class, uh, ruin their whole um, experience. Um, how much do we want to spend um, in terms of, of time lecturing versus doing um, other activities in class? What kind of experiences do you want the students to have? Like, are you going to take a field trip? Do you do labs? Are you going to include discussions or demonstrations? Um, all of these things are going to depend on the class and the nature of the class. 
Um, I know that we've talked about this very briefly before about how much time uh, in, term, in terms of students. So for classroom instruction for a three credit course is normally 150 minutes a week. So that's your class time instruction over the course of 14 weeks. Um, and it changes based off of like meeting time. So if you meet one day per week, right, you might have 165 minutes and you have to include a 15 minute break. Um, but there are federal regulations in terms of credit hours. And so typically one hour of classroom or direct faculty instruction and admit it, it, so it's, it's one hour of classroom um, or direct faculty instruction and then a minimum of two hours of out of class student work uh, each week. And so, you know, you're thinking about, you know, doing this in, in terms of time, you know, students should be spending at least five hours, you know, if not more studying, doing something outside of class per week. Um, and, you know, you want to scale that, you know, obviously at some certain points of the semester is going to be more work and at other points of the semester is going to be less work. Um, but you want to kind of think about that over the course of the entire semester. Um, how are you going to work in assignments, papers, problems, projects, exams, study time? You know, how are you going to work that into um, the scope of, of time there? Um, and then, of course, we have uh, really great, wonderful resources on the CTE website. They give you templates for the calendar and how many actual uh, meeting days there are. Always double check these because sometimes there may be a mistake or two. Um, but these are really helpful for you to kind of uh, say, okay, I've got this many meeting times for Monday, Wednesday, Friday class or this many meeting times for a Tuesday, Thursday class. And then sort of breaking it up based off of what you want to do ac uh, across the, the whole semester. Um, and then finally, I just, I want to reiterate this, I, the, these learning outcomes, the smart outcomes, the specific, measurable, agreed upon, realistic, and time frame. I went into these in detail in the last lecture, and so if you want need a recap, just go back and, and check those. But, um, you know, thinking about how we want to make sure that our learning outcomes are something that we can uh, set up that, that, you know, we know that students are going to be able to meet and that it's realistic and that um, we give them the right time frame to do so. So if you need to, a refresher on that, that, go back to that other um, lecture video where we kind of walk through those. The final thing is just something that I want to talk about um, in class. If we don't have anything that's specific, if you guys don't have any questions or something that you pulled out of the, the readings, for example, um, you know, things that we can talk about. What's the most important part of designing a course, in your opinion? Um, what do you think that the focus should start with and, and where should the, the focus mostly be? And then finally, just anecdotally, if you've gone through a really well-designed course, uh, what to you were the best parts of that course design? Like what kind of stood out to you as saying, wow, that was a really, really great class that I took. I feel like I learned a lot from it. And so we'll talk about your experiences there, about what made a really effective course. So we'll cover that uh, next time we meet. And if you have any thoughts, of course, jot those down and we will bring those to the table as well.